We have a session for regional anesthesia. Uh, we are going uh, uh, to speak about regional anesthesia for ambulatory total hip and total knee arthroplasty with Dr. Daniel Malouf. Dr. Daniel Malouf is a big friend for me. He is the director of adult reconstruction and joint, repl joint replacement anesthesia at the Department of Anesthesiology, Critical Care, and Pain Medicine at Hospital for the Special Surgery. Dr. Malouf was uh, the first member in my uh, local regional uh, diploma that I do that I do for 12 years in the uh, Divanese University. He uh, was very helpful for us. Uh, why? خلاص. شو نحكي أطروحة؟ It's nice to see you. Um, before, I, can everybody hear me? Hi, Daniel. Hi, Kifik. Thank you. Um, قبل ما بلش, I want to thank uh, Dr. Vanda Abirad uh, with uh, Planning Committee with Scientific Committee on the program الحلو. والكومنت تبع على اللوجو كمان كثير كثير عجبني اتس فيري انسبايرنج اند تاتشينج سو ام براود تو بي هير وذ يو توداي اي وش اي كود بي ذير ان بيرسون بس اي اي كودنت جيت تايم اوف وذ ذا فاملي اند ورك ذا واز هارد ليت مي سي اف ماي سكرين از غانا موف Okay, good. So the reason why I'm not with you is because this is where I spend most of my time. This is where I work, this hospital for special surgery. It's an orthopedic uh, hospital located on the Upper East Side of Manhattan between 70th and 71st Street and uh, East River. Um, so uh, last year we did about 50, more than 50,000 procedures and more than 10,000 procedures more than 10,000 of those were primary total hip, total knee, and uh, uni partial knee replacements. I don't have any disclosures, uh, any financial disclosures. I don't have any relationships with any of the industries and won't be discussing any off-use label for any of the medications. So today we're gonna talk about uh, ambulatory joint arthroplasty. We'll, uh, we'll talk about the type of anesthesia that, would, that is recommended for these cases. We'll talk about the challenges that uh, we face when we switch from an inpatient to an outpatient ambulatory, uh, to an outpatient joint replacement. We'll talk about the role that we can play as anesthesiologists and specifically regional anesthesiologists in making this program work effectively. And uh, with, with that, we'll cover some of the new blocks that have been uh, uh, showing up and uh, we'll talk about them as, as an adjunct to our regional anesthesia techniques to make those uh, ambulatory programs successful. 
So uh, why are we doing ambulatory joint arthroplasty? So in the last uh, decade or two, there has been a significant improvement in perioperative care, either with surgical procedures that have become minimally invasive, uh, switching approaches from posterior hip replacement to anterior hip replacement, from a total knee replacement to a unicondylar knee replacement. All these uh, changes have made it possible and easier for patients to regain functionality and be ready for discharge. The other more important, very important factor is pain management. We have come a long way with our use of regional anesthesia ever since the, the development the use of ultrasound in regional anesthesia has led to a very steep learning curve. And now you see many, many anesthesiologists facile with regional anesthesia. The development of fast track protocols and multimodal analgesia to expedite the rehabilitation process and get patients in and out fast. And then the part of this was a comprehensive patient education and patient optimization programs prior to them showing up for their surgery. On another side, from a financial side, the insurance companies have instituted a value-based care, which means the hospital will get a, a lump sum of money for an episode of care being a, a total hip or a total knee replacement. And then it's up to the hospital to use this money, that money efficiently, and whatever savings they can make will become profit. And on the regulatory side, the Medicare and Medicaid and CMS have changed the classification of these procedures from an inpatient only procedure to an outpatient procedure. So all these changes have made it possible for us to entertain the idea of ambulatory joint replacements. And we kind of under pressure to make that happen. So it doesn't come without challenges. Uh, it's, uh, it requires a lot of work for a, for a program to be successful. And a lot of the work has to be done beforehand, upstream in the process. And patient selection is very important. And then these patients, when they show up, they have to be medically optimized. They have to have everything needed. Their labs, their workup must be uh, seamless for them not to have cancellations on the day of surgery or to end up being transferred after their procedure to an inpatient unit. That will be a big failure for the program. And part of that, you have to include the family. At least one caregiver has to be involved uh, in, in the process and they have to agree to be part of the post-operative care for patients. And uh, they have to be involved in education and be part of the program. And uh, post-operatively, there must be ways for patients to reach you and discuss any issues that they have uh, for you to be able to identify any potential problems and treat them before they become uh, a bigger, bigger problems. So our part in doing all this uh, comes in uh, how patients do immediately post-operatively. And there are many things we can do to prevent uh, the common problems that happen with, with patients who undergo a joint replacement. So being a blood pressure control or sedation or uh, just urinary retention, uh, good pain management without with minimizing the narcotics is always very helpful. And sometimes the challenge can be very simple, like social issues. If the patient's right does not arrive on time, patient may not be able to leave. We don't send patients home in a taxi. It has to have uh, an adult with them and escort to get them home after anesthesia. So as you can see, there are many challenges that, uh, that we face, but we can play a very significant and important role to make programs like this successful. So starting with the type of anesthesia that we do, and there's always a debate in the United States about what is the ideal anesthetic for a joint replacement. And there, there are studies that support neuraxial blocks, neuraxial anesthesia, and there are studies that support general anesthesia. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, this group led by, by Stavros Memsudis, who is a colleague of mine, and what we worked together with a, with a big group of experts. They underwent this uh, meta-analysis and they looked at uh, anesthesia-related outcomes after surgery for patients undergoing both total hip and total knee arthroplasty. And uh, 
involved more than 100 studies. And here's what they found. They found that uh, noraxial blocks are advantageous when for total hip and total knee arthroplasty and minimizing post-operative outcomes. And they also found that if you do an oraxial block, in addition to a general anesthetic, you can still get some benefits over the group that only gets general anesthesia for their surgery. And the results were very similar for the total knee arthroplasty population. There was a great advantage to having an oraxial block over a general anesthetic for these patients in, in uh, minimizing post-operative, uh, poor post-operative outcomes. And this is what some of the outcomes that, that uh, that they looked at. And I highlighted this, this from the table from the article. I highlighted the complications that where the level of evidence is moderate. There's a lot more complications that, uh, that happened that they looked at, but the level of, of evidence was not, was low. So these are the ones where the level of evidence is moderate. And you can see there is a huge advantage to doing an oraxial block for in terms of minimizing pulmonary complications, urinary retention, uh, thromboembolic events and DVTs, and blood loss. And we kind of know that from our practice. And then for the total knee population, there were very similar results. The pulmonary complication rate was lower in the neuroaxial block group. The urinary retention was lower. And then readmission rates were lower in the neuroaxial uh, group. Um, then the same group, they looked at uh, the effect of peripheral nerve blocks added to the anesthetic, whether they have a positive outcome, positive effect on, on minimizing outcomes for, for these procedures. And uh, the results were very similar to the noraxial block. There was a, a, a big advantage to using uh, peripheral nerve blocks in total hip uh, arthroplasty patients. Similarly, for total knee arthroplasty patients, they were, they were able to show that the impact of uh, peripheral nerve blocks is significant and minimizing uh, perioperative outcomes and improving patient uh, performance after surgery. And here's the list. It's an extensive list, and I've highlighted the, the, the outcomes where the impact is moderate with the level of evidence where the impact is moderate. And it's very similar to the previous table. You see that there is pulmonary, uh, um, minimizing the risk of pulmonary events, MIs, uh, gastrointestinal um, issues and problems, delirium, and then thromboembolic event and minimizing uh, blood transfusion. And that was for total hip arthroplasty patients. And the, the, the effect, the, adv the advantages of peri peripheral nerve blocks are very similar in the total knee arthroplasty uh, population as well. When peripheral nerve blocks are uh, done, patients have less card cardiac events, less pulmonary problems, less GI issues, less cognitive dysfunction, and less blood transfusion. So now we see that regional anesthesia is, is advantageous for this setting, but the, the challenge for us in an ambulatory setting is to balance the sensory blockade with the motor blockade. So we have so many options to do a one, wonderful blocks that will provide complete sensory blockade for, for patients. However, these come at the expense of having a motor blockade, and motor blockade is not something that you want in an ambulatory setting. So we have to fine tune the way we do our anesthetics or our blocks to be able to accommodate the requirements of uh, patients being able to mobilize after surgery so they can do their physical therapy, meet their physical therapy goals so they can be discharged. So that can be done with minimizing the dose of local anesthetics, changing the type of local anesthetics that we do, moving the, blo the nerve blocks from, uh, from centrally to peripherally. Like we don't do lumbar plexus blocks anymore. Now we do adductor canal block and we don't do femoral blocks. We do adductor canal. We don't do sciatic nerve blocks. We do IPAX. So, so on and so forth. All the blocks are moving distally to minimize the impact on motor function and uh, the possibility of delay and discharge after surgery. 
So this is some data from our institution. And what we did here, we compared two groups of patients undergoing total knee arthroplasty. One group received periarticular injections only, and the other group received IPAC blocks, adductor canal blocks, and periarticular injection. And it sounds like a lot for, for patients uh, to get that just for a knee arthroplasty. But if you look at the results, the, the impact was significant. The patients did very well in the first 24 hours compared to the groups, to the group that only got periarticular injection. However, on post-up day two, those patients, the patients from the two groups, they, they did the same. They had this similar amount of pain. They required similar amount of narcotics at that point. So that is still a challenge for us. And now how do we extend the duration of analgesia from our regional blocks beyond the 24 or 36 hour marks when patients go home if we want to minimize opioid consumption and avoid all the side effects from it? So there are also other new blocks that have been have becoming more popular. And uh, this is a group from uh, North Carolina where they added uh, genicular blocks to, to the mix of blocks that they do for their total knee arthroplasty patients. And they, they found that by adding a genicular block to an IPAC and to an adductor canal catheter, they're able to decrease opioid consumption for these patients in the first 24 hours. Also, when they compared genicular blocks, another group compared genicular blocks to periarticular injection, and they were able, they were similar. Now, the problem with periarticular injection, just like nerve blocks, but I think in periarticular injection in particular, there is a huge variability in, in, uh, in uh, efficacy. And because it's very operator dependent, there are no specific landmarks that uh, people follow to do those uh, interventions. And uh, it's all operator dependent. Sometimes it's the attending surgeon doing them, and sometimes it's the PA or the resident that's doing them. So, and it's very hard to maintain that consistency in, in the delivery and effectiveness. And consistency is very important in an ambulatory setting because you cannot afford to have 10 or 20% of your patients having to be readmitted. That will be a failure for your program. So one way of extending this analgesia is to add to, to place perineural catheters and send patients home with, a, with an infusion and a bag and a pump that they can dispose of or return to the hospital after two or three days when their infusion, when their, uh, infusion is done. And this is effective. It's a, it requires a little bit more logistics to, to implement the program but it does work and it helps to reduce opioid consumption and improve functional outcome. There are other interventions on the market that I'm not gonna discuss because it's either a slow release local anesthetic or some other type of neuromodulation with, neurostim with, with neurostimulation that seem promising, but the data is not there yet. And we need more studies before we can do, we can actually say that it's, uh, it's doable. So uh, let's talk about analgesia for total hip. You know, in the past, if a patient with total hip replacement got a lumbar plexus block, they did very well for the first 24 hours or longer. And that was ideal. Or if they had an epidural and, and, and they, they were very comfortable, but we cannot do that now. So, and we cannot afford to have the motor blockade that is associated with the lumbar plexus block, for example. So we're moving to the periphery the way we do our blocks. And the supraingual fascia iliaca is a block that's been done recently. And it has been shown to decrease opioid consumption in these patients. Uh, it can be motor sparing because it's more peripheral. And it depends on the dose of local anesthetic that you use. Um, if you have a large dose that can act as a retrograde lumbar plexus block, but if you adjust your dose, you can be you're able to target the sensory branches of the femoral, um, femoral nerve and the lateral femoral cutaneous. And that can be helpful in providing some analgesia for patients after total hip replacement. Another block that has been discussed also is the anterior uh, uh, quadratus lumborum block. And it has been shown to reduce opioid consumption after a lateral approach 
to the hip, uh, posterior hip replacement. Um, how much and and by how it works and is still not very clear. Um, and more studies need to be done to see if it should be implemented as part of that pathway. Um, so when you compare uh, the CIFI, I'm going to call it CIFI, the supra-inguinal fascia iliaca block and the anterior QLB block, they can be very similar in terms of their, their impact on reducing opioid consumption as an effective analgesic technique. However, with the CIFI block, there is always this, um, this fear that um, it may have some motor function um, motor blockade function to it, and one, one must be wary. And in this study, they showed that it can cause some weakness um, immediately after surgery. Another nerve block that has been used is the peri pericapsular nerve group block. Um, has been shown that it has good uh, opioid sparing effect, and it's a good analgesic, and has not been shown to significantly. Uh, have an impact on motor function for these patients. And then when compared with, uh, with the supra-inguinal fascia iliacal uh, block, they can have similar analgesic effects. However, like I said before, with the CIFI, there is always this risk of uh, motor blockade and weakness, which can be detrimental in an ambulatory setting. In an ambulatory setting. Uh, and then you see studies like this, where they compared one of these, one of these blocks uh, to the periarticular injection, and they were not able to see any advantage to having the nerve block uh, over just a, a periarticular injection performed by, by the surgeon intraoperatively. And the problem with all these blocks is that we don't have a, an objective way to evaluate the success or the failure of the blocks. You, how do you test the dermatome after an IPAC block or after a pain block? Or how do you check if there is motor weakness or not? I um, mean, you can check as motor weakness, but that's not part of the success of the block. So that is a challenge for us. And we use surrogate measures for the success of the block by looking at VAS scores and opioid consumption. And we know how how um, inaccurate those measures can be for, for patients. Uh, so in conclusion, ambulatory joint replacement is here to stay. The numbers are going to increase and it's uh, driven by many factors. Uh, a major part of the success of this program has to be optimizing patients pre-op. Uh, education, uh, medical, Patient selection, not every patient is a candidate for ambulatory joint replacement. And then uh, as part of the fast track protocols, multimodal analgesia is an integral part of this pro these protocols. And then we need to fine tune the way we do our regional anesthetics to achieve good analgesia and uh, minimize the motor. And then to be able to do that selection, we need more data to validate the efficacy of all these new blocks that we talked about. And with that, I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel, thank you very much 
for this very uh, good presentation. Thank you. Uh, I want to see if there is uh, some question. Y a-t-il des questions dans la salle? I want to ask you, uh, Daniel, uh, anesthesiologist want to make more and more local regional anesthesia. But for the knee, it's a, you don't think that the surgeon will be not happy to put uh, IPAC genicular and canal adductor in a prothesis. We have too much problem. It's a problem of affection. What, what do you do in New York? Um, it is an issue. It's it's a big concern of mine, actually. Um, and uh, I I'm hesitant to do genital blocks and an eye pack on a patient who's going for a knee arthroplasty. Um, but the the it seems we have to do everything that we can to minimize the pain after surgery if we want these patients to go home. So that's the challenge that we have. Uh, a few weeks ago, as because I'm hesitant to do these nerve blocks, the genicular blocks, and particularly, and in, uh, in particular for for these patients for the risk of infection that you mentioned, um, I scrubbed in with one of my colleagues and to try to do teach them how to do these blocks intraoperatively after they let the tourniquet down and before they close, and it was a very easy thing to do because they're right there; they can see where where exactly where we would do the genicular blocks. Um, you know, we're, we're, in, uh, we're still early in that stage. And I, I think we have a lot of work to do to be able to, to get to a point where we can provide very good analgesia and minimizing the risk of infection and the number of injections that we have to do. So it is a challenge and I don't have, I don't have the, the silver bullet for, for this intervention, yeah. But I do agree with you, the risk of infection is very significant and infection uh, of, a, of, a, of a total joint is a life-changing event. Uh, patients will never be able to get rid of it. And, and we have to keep that in mind. There is another question from Dr. Malou. Daniel, yep. do you make a difference between ambulatory surgery and rack surgery in France? All everybody parle about rack rehabilitation aménagée of patients. Rack mm -hmm. is not only uh, uh, ambulatory. Do mm -hmm. you make the, uh, your knee arthroplasty and hip arthroplasty ambulatory? They go home or uh, another uh, enter, uh, a rehabilitation center, you mean? Uh, you have intermediate. No, so not, our, not all of our patients go home. We have a subset of patients. Our goal is to send more than 50% of our patients home now uh, within 23 hours of admission. So, so we have two subsets of patients. One subset, they go home from the, an eight and a half hours from the moment they register in the hospital. And that's very challenging. The second subset of patients go home in less than 20, 24 hours. So they spend the night in the hospital and they go home the following day before the 24 hour mark. But the challenge for, and these are okay because these are patients that are done in the hospital. So if they end up be, staying longer, it's not a big problem. It's a problem, but not a huge problem. The problem is when we start doing these procedures in a freestanding facility, and these patients are expected to go home, and if they don't go home, then we have to admit them to a, to a hospital. And the way this this works in the United States. If your freestanding facility, an ambulatory center in New York, if you readmit more than a, a certain percentage of patients per month or per year, 
that can become a state reportable incident and they will review your program and they, you may lose the option of uh, operating at that facility or doing these procedures. So it's, it's tightly regulated once you move outside the hospital into a freestanding facility. And that's why patient selection beforehand is, is very important because you can have a patient who's catastrophizing, has pain catastrophizing scale that is high and, and knows you have to weed them out because they can have a, a detrimental effect on your program. So when, do, when patients go home, when we talk about patients going home, they go home. They don't go to a, a rehab facility. Be welcome. Hello, so our upcoming talk is about regional anesthesia for chest wall uh, surgeries, presented by Dr. Uh, Adib Awaidit. Dr. Adib Awaidit is an assistant professor in the Department of General Anesthesia at the University of Iowa Academic Health Center. Dr. Awaidit completed his residency training in anesthesia at the American University of Beirut Medical Center. After finishing his residency in 2020, Dr. Awaidit left for the U.S. to join Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Cleveland for two consecutive uh, fellowships in regional anesthesia and acute pain, as well as obstetric anesthesiology. He is certified by the European Board of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care, and he's a member of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, the European Society of Regional Anesthesia, and Society of Obstetric Anesthesia and Perinatology. Dr. Awainet has published several articles in peer-reviewed journals, as well as having been an invited speaker on a number of topics related to pain management. Dr. Awainet. Dr. Awainet. Dr. Awainet.
Okay, thank you everybody uh, for this kind welcome and uh, good morning uh, to everybody in the States and good evening to everybody in Lebanon. I wish I was there, but uh, I can't, so I'm presenting virtually. So Dr. Kanaza ended his uh, amazing lecture with a nice uh, quote. I will start it with another quote. So your degree is just a piece of paper and your education is seen in your behavior and always remember that. So regional anesthesia for chest wall surgeries, it's a very a relatively new topic and it's one of my favorite topics and I will be discussing it today. So I have nothing to disclose except some of the content of the presentation was shared by my dear uh, mentor, Dr. Solomon, and some of the videos are from Duke University. And this lecture is uh, intended to be for the adult population, and I cannot give any thoughts about the pediatric population. So my job in this lecture is to uh, try to convince you why it's important to learn these types of new blocks. And uh, but the objective of this presentation is to have a uh, to perform a uh, to I'm going to mention the surgeries that are that have high opioid prescription on discharge. I will also discuss the anatomy uh, of and innervation of the uh, thoracic chest wall, anterior, lateral, and posterior, as well as the muscle uh, anatomy. Then afterwards, we will discuss very briefly the sonar anatomy of the thoracic chest wall, and then we will discuss the different types of blocks that we use uh, for chest wall surgeries and a little, uh, I'll touch a little bit on the literature. So cardiothoracic surgeries, uh, traditionally, we usually don't do these uh, blocks for them. And although it's one of the most painful uh, surgeries and the incidence of chronic pain is 20% after sternotomy and 25 to 60% the, after thoracotomy. And you know the decreased uh, lung functionality, the atelectasis, the hypoxia, and the decreased uh, tidal volume that patients are intubated usually, and they want to take out the tube. And sometimes you cannot put an epidural because of contraindications. So recently, there's been a high rise in the use of chest wall uh, uh, blocks for, for obvious reasons. And cardio discharge over than over than more than 200 uh, uh, oral morphine equivalent. And if you look at the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program data for three academic centers in 2017, you will see that orthopedic surgery is at the top of the list. And if you look very closely, you will see that uh, thoracoscopic budget uh, resection is three times the upper normal of overprescribed opioids. So when discussing uh, uh, pain pathways, uh, usually we have a tissue injury, and then this uh, pain sensation is uh, transmitted through the peripheral nerves, and then it goes to the central neuraxial, and then to the brain, and you will perceive pain. So, we, so the options that we have is to do an epidural or pervertebral, so called central neuraxial block, or we can go in and do a peripheral nerve block or facial plane blocks. So thoracic epidurals. It is usually the gold standard for the thoracic surgeries. However, we have contraindications for them, such as patient, patient refusal, coagulation, abnormalities, or difficult spine anatomy. However, we really are very familiar and comfortable doing an epidural, and it always gets the job done. And usually a single injection or a single uh, needle will give you a bilateral block. It will cover multiple dermatomes and it blocks all, not only some, uh, somatic pain, but also visceral pain. And you can mix uh, local anesthetics too. However, uh, epidural doesn't go without any side effects. We have a risk of hypertension, epidural hematoma. And if you give enough local anesthetic in the epidural space at the thoracic area, you're gonna block the cardiac accelerator fibers and you're gonna have T1, T3, T4 block, sympathectomies, and bradycardia, and you will have to give vasopressors. And especially in this vulnerable population where you have a lot of uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, problems, you don't want to avoid having hypertension and bradycardia, and it will delay the uh, uh, discharge. So what other options do we have? We can do a paravertebral block, and then a paravertebral block is blocking unilaterally uh, one side of the, of the chest wall, 
So you have to do two uh, injections on both sides and you have to uh, take into consideration the local anesthetic systemic toxicity that comes with paravertebral blocks because it's a vascular area and it's not an easy block to perform. Um, it requires advanced skills and it has its complications of pneumothorax. Sometimes you cannot see the needle very well, especially in obese uh, population. So if we're trying to transition from center neuraxial all the way to the periphery, as you can see in this picture, uh, I'm gonna discuss, so the spinal nerves, how does it originate? So we have the dorsal root and the ventral root, and these roots combine to form the spinal nerve right here. And this spinal nerve, as it goes out of the intervertebral foramen, it will go, give off a dorsal rami, which will uh, go in and, uh, and pierce in the rectus spiny muscles and give lateral, medial, and posterior branches. Uh, what's left of the spinal nerve will also give off anterior uh, sympathetic rami, and this anterior sympathetic rami will go in and sign up with the uh, sympathetic trunk, and this will give you a sensation of visceral pain. And if you continue to follow the spinal nerve um, more anteriorly, it will travel as a ventral rami below the rib, below its corresponding upper lip, and it will take the name of the upper lip. And as it goes all the way more lateral, 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 as it reaches super, um, more laterally, it will give off a lateral cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve. And if we continue to, to go more anteriorly of the chest, uh, before it goes through the, uh, because, uh, as it goes uh, close to the sternum, by, uh, by, by going between the innermost intercostal and the intercostal uh, muscle, it will pierce this muscle and gives off an anterior cutaneous branch. So as you can see, you can block these nerves at different locations. Why don't we do an intercostal nerve block? However, uh, as, you, uh, as you may know, that the intercostal nerves, the ventral ramis, as they go through the path from lateral to, me, uh, to anterior, they form plexuses uh, between different levels. So blocking one uh, ventral rami or intercostal nerve at one level will not achieve the, uh, the job. It will not uh, have the job uh, done. So you have to do multiple injections when doing intercostal nerves. However, you all know, already know that intercostal is a very highly vascularized area and you also have to worry about last. And the other alternatives are doing an erector spiny, a, pec a pecto intercostal facial plane blocks, transverse thoracic plane blocks, pec one blocks, pec two blocks, and serratus. And I will mention them all in the next uh, few slides. So facial plane blocks. There is no formal definition. The target is usually between um, certain muscles. So any, uh, any type, uh, any muscle, for example, between the pectoralis and the intercostal, they call it pecto, uh, pecto intercostal facial pain block. Erector spiny is just putting the local anesthetic just uh, posterior to the transverse process where the erector spiny muscles are. So this is how they made the definition of the facial plane blocks. Uh, ultrasound is mandatory and it's a volume block and it's spread dependent. So the spread is dependent on how much volume you give. So who can do it? So anyone who has an ultrasound machine and a needle can perform this block. And uh, you can see in this uh, diagram, the rise of facial plane blocks. There's a, been a rise in the number of publications uh, and now it's continuing to rise because there's a lot of interest in these type of blocks for about, uh, various reasons. First. They are more superficial blocks. Then you have less uh, 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 to worry about anticoagulation, and uh, it's they are easier to perform than the neuraxial blocks. So, if you this is a very nice uh, cross sectional view of the thorax, and I want you to focus on this picture because understanding this uh, anatomy will allow us to understand how to perform these blocks. So, if you look more posteriorly you will see the transverse process on both sides here. And the superficial, you have the three muscle layers of the spine. You have the spinalis muscle, the iliocostalis, and the uh, long, longismus muscle. So these muscles are correspond to the erector spiny muscle. And if you go more lateral, you, have, you start to see the latissimus dorsi. And superficial to the latissimus dorsi, you start at the lateral end of the chest fold to see the serratus start to uh, come up and then it becomes thickened, thickened, and then it becomes narrow again. And as it got, becomes narrow again in the anteriorly, you will see the pec minor come in. Uh, and uh, if you go more anteriorly, you will start to see the pectoralis major muscle. So I want you to uh, uh, keep uh, 
a visual uh, image of this in your brain so we can discuss the different blocks. So if you look at this picture, so we have all the different options of uh, blocking the chest wall in this uh, picture. You have, can do a spine anesthesia, thoracic epidural anesthesia, paravertebral block, erector spiny. If you go more lateral, you can do the intercostal nerve block. If you go more lateral, anterior lateral, you will do the serratus anterior plane block, a PEC 2, a PEC 1. And then if you go more anteriorly, so that, uh, doing a sternotomy or any anterior uh, medial rib fracture, you can do a para um, thoracic plane block or a pecto intercostal facial plane block. So we'll discuss para uh, erector spiny in, uh, uh, in brief. So it's a para uh, vertebral block by proxy. Usually when we do a para vertebral block, you go and in the paravertebral space and you try to uh, pierce the superior costal transverse ligament here. So you go through the erector spiny muscles, you pierce the costal transverse ligament, and then you push the pleura away and you can block the ventral rami, dorsal rami, and anterior rami. That's why a paravertebral block is an amazing block for visceral and somatic pain. However, with an erector spiny, you, you don't have to go that deep and you don't have to worry about the pleura. You just go in with the needle, uh, in plane or out of plane, whatever you want, you touch the transverse process and you peel off the spinalis longismus and iliocostalis muscles from the transverse process. And that way you will, you were hoping that some of the local anesthetic, because it's a volume uh, dependent block, it will travel all the way and go diffuse uh, into the paravertebral space. So a, para, a rector spine is usually called a paravertebral block by proxy. Hope Hoping that some of the local anesthetic that can come uh, that can travel anteriorly and block the paravertebral space. And if you if that happens, then you will get a good uh, block for the chest wall. If you if it doesn't, then you will not have a good uh, block for the chest wall. And this is uh, another image showing you how putting a local anesthetic in the transverse uh, 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 posterior to the transverse process, some of the uh, local anesthetic, if you give enough volume, uh, can spread into the paravertebral space. And you can see the amount of publications uh, that have been uh, there for erector spiny blocks, and it's continuing to rise. Um, and I'm gonna go, gonna go a little bit with technique. So usually we put the probe in the uh, parasagittal orientation two to three centim two centimeters from the midline, and you can see the uh, hyperechoic structure of the of the transverse process. So hyperechoic structure, acoustic shadow, hyperechoic structure, acoustic shadow. And then you can see the three muscle layers of the erector spiny. You go in with the needle and in, uh, in plane either coda to cephalad or cephalad to coda. And what you are trying to achieve is uh, to peel off the erector spiny muscles from the, from the transverse process. So you usually get a good uh, dorsal rami, you will be able to block the dorsal rami always with an erector spiny. So it's good for spine surgeries preoperatively to do that. And uh, but uh, getting a good chest wall block, uh, it depends on if the solution goes into the paravertebral space. So for the thoracic area, usually 30 ml can cover from six to eight levels. It's not that accurate, but that's usually the, the case. It depends on who's doing the block and in the lumbar area, just giving 30 mLs would give you like four levels of block. So the indications, as I mentioned earlier, open thoracic surgeries and thoracoscopy, if the solution goes into the paravertebral space, rib fracture and as it analgies, so any posterior rib fracture, this is a good block to perform posterior rib fractures, breast surgeries, abdominal and pelvic procedures and spine surgeries. I will touch on this article from the Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia, and it showed shown that erector spiny is an effective analgesia after thoracic surgery, and compared with other techniques, is very safe, and there is no clinically important difference for post-operative pain control. Now I will jump a little bit to the anterior lateral chest wall, so we're moving from posterior to anterior, and um, I want to mention that it's very important to understand the anterior lateral chest wall, because not all the innervation from the uh, of the anterior lateral chest wall comes from the internal thoracic uh, internal uh, from the intercostal nerves. Some of them come from the brachial plexus, so the sub subclavian nerve, from the medial and lateral pectoral nerves, and from the long thoracic nerves. And these are will not be covered by the epidural. So epidural paravertebrals or erector spiny will not cover um, 
uh, nerves that are coming from the brachial plexus or the cervical plexus also, because you have the supraclavicular nerve, which comes more anteriorly here and it will cover uh, uh, on top of the clavicle. So as I mentioned earlier, these nerves are we're blocking between facial nerves. So these nerves co uh, uh, combine together and form plexuses. So when doing a facial plane block, uh, you need enough volume to, uh, in order to spread to, in order to cover all these nerves. And you're not tar targeting a specific nerve. So anterior lateral chest walls, we have different types of uh, uh, blocks, sorry. Uh, we can do a PEC one. So here is more anterior, as I said before, the spinal, uh, and the spinal nerve that gives us the dorsal rami, anterior rami, which becomes the uh, uh, sympathetic rami, which co goes and synapses with the sympathetic trunk. And then we have the ventral rami, which uh, continues to go more anteriorly. Laterally here, it will be the, the lateral cutaneous branch of the inter uh, intercostal nerve. And as it goes more and more anteriorly, it pierces the triantus thoracic muscle anteriorly here to give the, off the anterior cutaneous branches. So lateral chest wall incisions can be covered by all these types of blocks. Serratus, it will cover you more anterior lateral. PEC1 and PEC2 will cover more um, uh, anteriorly and erector spinal uh, more posteriorly. So we'll go very briefly about PEC1. Sorry, my mouse is having some trouble. Okay, so we'll go to PEC1. So PEC-1 is, I usually use it for any implants or tissue expanders, uh, any ICD placement or many invasive uh, cardiothoracic surgery. And it's not uh, very far, uh, like you can always uh, combine uh, PEC-1 with a PEC-2 uh, or do a PEC-2 or combine uh, PEC-1 with a serratus or a serratus with an actor spine. So you can always combine blocks together. What about PEC2? So PEC2, you're getting more of the lateral chest wall. So you, it's good for breast surgery and with axillary lymph node dissections. So any surgery involving the, uh, uh, the anterior lateral chest wall, you can cover uh, with a PEC2 and you get a T2 to T6 coverage usually. But all these blocks, PEC1, PEC2, or serratus, uh, they spare the midline because they will not be able to cover the anterior cutaneous branch of the uh, interventral uh, rami that's traveling more anteriorly. So how do we do the scanning? It's a very easy block to perform. You just put the probe in the infraclavicular region, like you're doing an infraclavicular block for a brachial plexus. And then you will uh, go uh, tilt the probe more immediately uh, to see the ribs. And then you will start counting the ribs from the second rib because we load the clavicle, it's the second rib, and you go, you can't, you go no more laterally until you go below the axilla and you're at the third, fourth rib, and then you will start seeing the serratus muscle. So this is the serratus block, anterior plane block, and this is where you want to put the local anesthetic. It's between the serratus muscle and the latissimus, and the latissimus dorsi muscle. And this is the complex innervation of the chest wall, and you will see, like, again, the uh, nerves from the brachial plexus and the superficial cervical plexus and the uh, uh, nerves coming from the spine, the intercostal nerves. And doing a steratus can get you from uh, a range from T2 to T9, depending how you are doing it. And you will be able to block the intercostal brachial nerve, which is a T1, T2 nerve coming from T1, T2, the long thoracic nerves, which is coming from the brachial plexus and the thoracodorsal nerve, which is also coming from the brachial plexus. And this is the dermatomal distribution when you're doing a, a serratus anterior plane block and you can see the ribs here. Uh, any anterior or anterior lateral rib fracture, you can block with this uh, type of block. The indications are anterior lateral rib fractures, breast surgeries, thoracotomies. I, I use them in my fellowship all the time for thoracotomies and they work really well. Any ICD placement or minimally invasive cardiac surgeries. So we'll go through this video and we will see how to perform this block. So as I said, we go into the infraclavicular area and you will see the axillary artery and the lateral cords, uh, posterior and medial cords and the axillary vein. And this is the pectoralis major muscle. And then you will uh, tip the probe more uh, medially. You will see, start seeing the pectoralis major, the pectoralis minor and the rib. And between the ribs, you have the pleura, and then costal muscles. As you go more lateral, you'll start, uh, the pectoralis minor here will start to taper off 
and you will start seeing the serratus muscle. And the serratus comes in more lateral. It starts to thicken, 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 and then more superficial, you start seeing the latissimus dorsi muscle. So doing a serratus is either putting the local anesthetic above the serratus muscle or just deep to the serratus by touching the rib and sloughing off the serratus of the rib. You can do a superficial or a deep block. So what about the data about serratus? So this is a nice article. You can look at it. It shows that SAP block is an effective adjuv adjuvant treatment option for post-operative uh, thoracic surgery analgesia. And it's an easy block to perform and has low potential for side effects. And that's because it's a superficial block and you can always compress if you were worried about hematoma. Another article showing that uh, SAP block is non-inferior in, uh, to standard paravertebral blocks in terms of 48 hours opioid consumption and is associated with improved uh, functional measures in thoracic surgery patients. And the last but not least, this is the systematic review showing that uh, uh, single shot uh, SAP and PECS reduce pain scores con compared to uh, systematic analgesia in cardiothoracic surgery for six to eight hours. It has a higher du duration of action than intercostal because less the vascular release, but it has a lower uh, uh, duration and, uh, of action than uh, thoracic paravertebrates. And if you do a continuous infusion catheter, it provides uh, comparable analgesia to thoracic epidural analgesia because you are covering the brachial plexus and the superficial uh, break, uh, the break, uh, the break plexus and the superficial cervical plexus too. And that's why you can see that it balances out at the end. And last uh, two blocks I wanna talk about are anterior medial chest wall blocks, which are the pecto intercostal facial plane block, which is a block between the pectoralis major muscle and the intercostal muscle. And the transverse thoracic plane block, which is the continuation of the innermost intercostal muscle anteriorly, we call it transverse thoracic muscle, and we just put the local anesthetic there, deep to it. And we, the main uh, goal of these is to cover any sternotomy pain, any uh, sternotomy incision from cardiac surgeries is, uh, that's been spread by PEC1, PEC2, or SAP, we can cover it by these type of blocks. So again, this is the spine, and if you go more anteriorly, you can see the muscles here. We have the external intercostal muscle, the internal intercostal muscle, and the innermost intercostal muscle. As, as you go more anteriorly, you, the innermost intercostal muscles becomes the transverse thoracic muscle. And the in, uh, external intercostal muscles will just become a, like a tendon, a tendon. And then we have, we can block the nerve, the anterior cutaneous branch, either here between the pectoralis major muscle and the inner, internal intercostal muscle or the transverse thoracic muscle, which is doing, the, uh, doing it superficial to the uh, transverse thoracic muscle. Excuse me, Dr. Awedet, can we go through the, the blocks uh, quickly because we're running out of time? Yes, sure. Thank so you. indications as midline sternotomy, as I talked to you, as I mentioned earlier, thymectomy, sternal fractures, and medial rib fractures. And you usually need 20 ml of local anesthetic, and that will give you a good block for sternotomy. I will not go through the, uh, for these type of blocks, it requires more time and we're short of time. So I will keep it for another day. I will just mention that uh, there is a picture worth a thousand words, and you can look at this picture, and it will show you that these are the different types of blocks and the different uh, dermatomal distribution if you're performing the blocks. So if you're doing a pector intercostal or a transverse thoracis, you will get this uh, midline sternotomy uh, coverage. If you want to do a PEC one, this is the coverage that you get. If you do a SAP, you get more lateral and more uh, distal coverage from the SAP. And intercostal, you know, you get only one uh, block and you have to do multiple blocks. And if you want to remember one picture from my lecture, it is this picture. Uh, and if you know where the incision is, you know which block you can perform. Very briefly, uh, you can either use a catheter or you can use a uh, liposomal bepivacaine. It's not FDA approved yet, but we, I did it in my fellowship. I used to use it as a rescue block for patients uh, who had heart lung transplant and it works really well, but data are still lacking. Um, last but not least, we cannot uh, um, continue talking about any recommendation without talking about PROSPECT and PROSPECT are a group of anesthesiologists and surgeons in the European society of region anesthesia and acute pain, and they 
mention uh, recommendations for uh, uh, surgeries, for different types of surgeries. And that's, for example, they mentioned that it's a grade A evidence for, for uh, performing SAP, erector spiny uh, blocks for, for that surgery. And you can see that there are, there are other uh, um, recommendations, uh, uh, other uh, techniques for uh, analgesia that are not recommended. And you can see this article, last article, guideline for enhanced recovery after lung surgery. And you can see that we've been shifting away from epidurals for thoracic surgeries. And we're trying to uh, perform uh, these facial plane blocks, which provide adequate analgesia, as well as uh, a decreased uh, length of stay in the uh, hospital. So a new concept of region anesthesia, no specific dermatome or peripheral nerve, it is spread or volume, uh, spread is volume dependent and ultrasound identification.